The rich man secured his food and drink by playing the market to his advantage, but he could never be sure he had enough. Disciples are to resist anxiety by trusting in the divine provision of enough for everyone, which is God's good pleasure to gift us with. We do not need to be afraid. How do you think this stuff will go down in your church? <laughs> well, it turns out it's in the book, right in the pew in front of us. This is why we can feel free to re-communitize wealth with a special concern for the poorest, which is what Jesus now abruptly commands us to do. His rationale is simple. Thieves cannot steal what isn't held privately. And moths can't eat what is stored up. It's brilliant stuff, friends. Interestingly, Jesus' brother James, who I guess grew up listening to stuff like this, later uh, in his epistle employs this very image of moth-eaten wealth in his rant against the murderous affluenza of the rich. Your riches have rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. You have laid up treasure for the last days. You've lived on the earth in luxury and pleasure. Fat your hearts on a day of slaughter. I didn't write this stuff. <laughs> But comes as no surprise then that Jesus will shortly make the same demand in Luke's story, in the story of the call of the rich young ruler. Notice the same call to take and sell and redistribute. Well, here the teaching returns to the imperative of economic justice with which it began. The cosmology of the non-anxious interdependent web of life is by definition relational. This means our economies must fundamentally be relational also. The purpose of capital is to repair and build social relations beginning with the poor. Community has been restored to the center of the cosmology. Or, as Jesus says it in so much fewer words, where your treasure is, there will your hearts be also. Well, friends, um, more than any other text, I think, this remarkable gospel teaching that we've just looked at links ecology, economics, and faith, and clearly articulates the cosmological foundations for Sabbath economics. Jesus challenges us to live as if there is a there there, a great economy undergirded by divine compassion. That is what truly holds us together despite everything pulling us apart. Now, what this means for us, well, that's the point of the next 36 hours of conversation. We rightly now turn to make this simple thing complex. Our job is to do detailed analysis and policy and advocacy, to look at practical strategies of resistance and renewal. I know I've got my priorities. They would include things like bioregional economics, habitat restoration, ethnobotany and indigenous traditions, community investing, uh, household covenant work, and of course, popular education uh, in this vein. But before we get down to cases, I think it might be useful to remind ourselves of, of a few ground rules. This is, these are ground rules we use in our own household covenant work that we do that some of you in the room, Mike, Mike and John and others, have been uh, using us to, to do this in small little groups. And those sort of rules of thumb are threefold. Let's remember that we're all subjects in this work. Everybody has a part to play, no matter what our context or skill set. Secondly, this work is profoundly personal and profoundly political, and that means no step we propose is too small, and no step we propose is too big. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, I believe our historical crisis demands a kind of a radical honesty regarding our collective addictions. This gathering should have the spirit of a 12-step meeting. 
What we don't need is moral posturing or political polemics, but how are we going to survive this sickness unto death? So let us keep in mind Wendell Berry's dictum. The great obstacle, he says, is simply this, the conviction that we cannot change because we're dependent upon what is wrong. But he says, that is the addict's excuse, and it will not do. Uh, I've known Marie a long time, and she's one of my heroes and one of my friends. And uh, many of you know the art of John Swanson, um, the great LA-based artist. And uh, I want to present Marie with this poster uh, to this conference because I love uh, the way he's talking about let's work together, we can make a difference. So I want to present this in the spirit of our task together. You all, you all know the work of John Swanson. So, let's get at it. Let's immerse ourselves in the questions of how to more strategically build a movement, as Greider put it, to dismantle or re-engineer the status quo. But let's never lose sight of the simple enormity of our vocation. As people of faith, above all friends, let us not be embarrassed to invoke and to rely on old wisdom, including scripture. It's our civilization that is pursuing a dangerous fantasy, not the scriptures. Our current crisis, we who groan under the ecological politics of scarcity and the economics of disparity, invite us to have ears to hear the birds and the flowers in order to relearn the cosmology and practices of Sabbath economics. Thanks very much, y'all, for your... Wonderful beginning. We have about five minutes for some just comments, thoughts, questions. Uh, your your opportunity to just say a few words. So, um, this is just a, something that I've been I think thinking about. Can you hear it back? You can stand up. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, just something that I've been kind of thinking about that, that seems to me to be coming into my head instinctually. This is not a question or anything, but just kind of a, a, a comment on what you were talking about, and it just resonated with me very deeply. Um, but I think as, you, as, as we're talking about the, the storing up and the, the I and I and I, I, for the past year or so, I keep finding myself thinking about this whole thing of the the 401ks and the IRAs, and everyone has to have a 401k and an IRA. And if you don't have one, then somehow you're, you're stupid. And I keep getting this, this, this wondering of thinking, am I storing, what am I storing up this money for? And is it something that, that I want to, to give back and share? I don't know if this makes sense, but it's just what you were saying just really resonated with me and the, the whole Luke 12, and it makes me think about this, this storing up and that God does provide for all of us for, for our, our time. And I don't know. So I just wanted to offer that just kind of food for thought, and it's just something I'm thinking about and I think being challenged maybe by, by God. So. Thanks, Sarah. Yep. Other food for thought? Yes. I'd like to offer a little exegesis on the exegesis of the ravens. <laughs> in the North Woods, the ravens in the summer hunt more or less in the individual as far as their food gathering is concerned. But in the winter, their behavior entirely changes. And they work collectively. And they live primarily off the 